Hi, my name's Roger. I'm making this video in January 2021. I've been working on it for about a year now. In fact, I wrote a piece when I was in prison in 2019 called Advice to Young People as You Face Annihilation. And I finally got round to doing this video. It's primarily aimed at young people. Usually when I make a video, I'm talking to my friend Jamie, but I've decided to look at you in the camera. So, because I'm talking directly to you as young people, and obviously there's older people watching it, that's fine, but that's what it's aimed at. And I'm gonna take my time talking to you because obviously it doesn't need saying, but what I'm gonna talk about is enormously emotional enormously challenging and requires a lot of attention and seriousness. So that's what I'm hoping to give it. As you may know, I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion. At this point, I'm a co-leader of the anti-political party Burning Pink. I've spent 35 years organising people in various social movements and I've been at King's College in London studying civil disobedience and civil resistance for five or six years now. And I'm going to share my thoughts with you. Okay, so as I say, this is going to be quite long. I'm not quite sure how long it's going to be. But if you want to take a break, that's good. If you just want to look at a little bit of it, that's good. If you want to stop looking at it, that's fine. It's your life. Um, it's going to be pretty rough and ready because if you see my other videos, you know, I just ramble on and do what I do. And I'm going to sort of argue that that's probably the best way to bring about social change anyway, is to be authentic and get on with the job. Don't try and be perfect. I'm going to use pretty basic language, um, trying to make everything as clear as I can. And... What I guess I'm aiming at is, I'm not looking at numbers in this video, what I'm looking at is to communicate with the key, you know, few dozen or few hundred or maybe few thousand young people in the world who are going to be the leaders of the civil resistance movements over the next 10 years. That's my grand aim. So I'd much rather talk to a few people who are actually going to get on with the job and talk to lots of people who are going to go, well, that was an interesting video, and then, you know, go back onto social media or watch Netflix or whatever. So that's my idea. I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if it doesn't, we'll try something else. Thank you very much for watching. And, um, yeah, I will go on through a few introductory comments, and then we'll take, we'll go through the text of what I've got to say. Okay, so yeah, just to reiterate, you don't need to watch this video. <laughs> There's no pressure. <laughs> so if you don't like what you've seen, that's fine. Switch it off and go and do something else. That's the first thing. And for any adults here that are going to be outraged by what I'm saying, I'm serious. People don't need to watch it. It's your choice. The second thing to say, I guess, is I'm not going to try and convince you. That's not my aim in this video. Trying to convince people is a bit of a mugs game in my view. What you should do if you want to change the world is tell the truth. And paradoxically, as you might say, through telling the truth, through saying, this is my view, you actually become more convincing. But it's up to you whether you agree with me. And what I would suggest is you take what you agree with and run with it. And if you don't agree with part of what I'm saying, then leave it. And this is a really smart way, I think, of approaching people who make videos or write books or make opinions. Don't feel like you have to be pro-Roger or anti, right? Just look at it, use your own intelligence and choose what you want to do. Um, I suppose what I need to say is I'm an expert in this field. And if you're an expert in the field, then you have a right and responsibility to communicate what you think about the subject you're an expert in. But I want to make clear that just because you're an expert doesn't mean you're right. 
It just means you're likely to be right. So again, you should be appreciate what I've got to say, arguably, but not take it just because I've said it. Look at it critically, analyze it, and hopefully build on what I've got to say. The other thing to say is what I'm actually saying to you is not that radical. I'm not making some big political argument in this video. I'm going to go through what the situation is and in my view, what needs to be done about it. What it is, is very emotional. So the real problem here is not with the information. It's about whether you emotionally are going to be able to take it on board. And maybe you will, maybe you won't. But as you can see from the title of what I've said, I'm going to be pretty blunt because I think that's the most respectful way of dealing with the subject and not being euphemistic. Okay, so I wrote this text and I'm not going to read it out, I'm just going to sort of talk about it, in prison in September 2019. So I've been working on it for quite a long time and the actual original text I'm hoping to put in the blurb below this YouTube video so you can look at it. And what I'm going to, what it focuses on is first of all what's happening in the real world. So I'm not going to be using the word science. I'm just going to be talking about the real world which is, or you know, something that you should be interested in because it's real. And then secondly, I'm going to be looking at the political responses of that from a sort of sociological point of view. In other words, does it work? I'm not going to be judging it necessarily. And, and then I'm going to be looking at the basics of action and organisation. So you can see other videos that I've done or other people have done to work out the nuts and bolts. So what I'm trying to do is give like an overview and at the bottom of this video on the YouTube, assuming it goes on YouTube, uh, there'll be the references and connections and all the links. And at the moment I'm working with a group called uh, Last Generation, which are young people around the world preparing to undertake civil disobedience. And there'll be a Zoom link possibly to an open meeting you can go to and you can go and find out more. Because needless to say, or maybe I should say it, you can watch as many videos as you like, but nothing's gonna change unless you take action. And that's one of me, going to be one of my main messages. Okay, so, what I'm gonna be trying to say in this video, the broad overview, if, if you like, is, is that I'm profoundly disappointed but not surprised by the inability of young people around the world to engage in effective civil disobedience. And I'm disappointed because we're going to fail to overcome the political opponents we have unless there's mass civil disobedience by young people. And I'm not surprised that this has failed to happen in any substantial way so far because, as I'll go on to explain, there's a whole bunch of political and social groups and forces that are trying to persuade young people to do things that don't work. And I'm not going to be like massively judgmental about that. I'm just going to explain through my arguments why that is the case. And I'm going to suggest, of course, that there's a new way of doing things. And in a funny sort of way, that new way of doing things really has more to do with the past. In other words, before 1990, the 20th century. And you may see some clips of what people used to do in the good old days, as it might say, when they decided is enough is enough. So I want to, yeah, tell you a little bit about myself. So one of the things you should know is that I was very active as a young person in a social movement, in the peace movement in the 1980s. So I actually got involved in politics, as you might say, when I was about 13, 14, because I was a bit of a nerd, <laughs> and a bit weird like that. Anyway, like you know, maybe many of you watching this video, I was absolutely passionate about 
the peace movement at the time. And if you don't know about this, there was a very real prospect there was going to be a nuclear war and that would involve a nuclear winter, which would effectively extinguish the human race in a matter of days or weeks. So this was absolutely terrifying for me and many people in my generation. So I have a sort of special empathy, I suppose, connection with young people today who are going through a similar turmoil over what's happening with the climate crisis. But one of the things to take from that, of course, is, is young people have faced annihilation many times through history. It's not actually unusual. What's unusual in the particular case is, is if the climate crisis isn't sorted out, then it will be our last it will be our last chapter, as you might say. OK, so I got involved in the peace movement. I went to, I was involved in the Methodist Church and they sent me to India when I was 18. And when I was in India, I went to a civil rights uh, movement um, group in Raipur in India. And the week before I arrived, around 20 workers in a textile strike had been shot dead and the police went into the villages of the strikers and raped the wives of the guys who had been shot by the police. So, you know, like a lot of 18-year-olds, I was pretty cocky and thought I knew a lot about the world. And that knocked me flat. And in some ways, I've never recovered from that experience. And what that taught me, and one of the lessons, I suppose, that I want to try and communicate, is the world is, is real and terrible, beyond terrible things happen to people. And we can't ignore that. And if we ignore it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so when I came back from India, I wasn't exactly traumatised, that's the wrong word. I just felt a real clear life purpose that what I was going to spend my life doing was, to the best of my ability, to stop that needless cruelty and injustice in the world. And I got a scholarship to the London School of Economics because I was quite brainy and everything. And if you've been to an elite university, you probably know, you know, they're on, you're on a conveyor belt into the various elites, you know, the government, big business. I found the whole prospect pretty obscene. I was very moralistic at those times. And I left after a year. I spent a year reading about Gandhi and civil disobedience. I got arrested for the peace movement lots of times. I went to prison three times before I was 21. And that was the culture that I was in. So that really marked me out for what I see is what social change is about. And I got involved in workers' cooperatives and housing cooperatives and social movement work for about 10 years. And then I was an organic farmer for around 20 years. And as you may know, with a lot of farmers around the world, their crops have been destroyed because of extreme climate change events. And to cut a long story short, I decided to get back involved in the climate crisis situation. I went to King's College and did field research, which means going out embedded, working with campaigns, uh, rent strikes and trade union campaigns. And then I helped found Extinction Rebellion two and a half years ago now. So what I'm trying to say, my little pitch, as you might say, is I've been thinking about this literally like every week, how to bring about effective political change ever since, for 35 years, since I was a teenager. That's my life's work. And I've been researching it in a systematic way, as you might say, in a professional way in King's College uh, for the last five or six years. And just to reiterate, that doesn't mean I'm right. What it means is I just know a lot about it. So, you know, you've got to make your decisions on what I've got to say. The, the other thing is, the other last two points is that if you're going to study something and you're going to get good at it, you've got to do it. So during the last six years, I've been arrested around 20 times. I've been in prison for about three months on three occasions, overall about three months. And I've been on two hunger strikes. I've done that because I'm passionate about the need for action, but I've also done it because if I'm going to talk to you guys, I need to walk my talk. Partially because I've got some credibility, but 
Also because I need to have concrete data, concrete information about how this thing works and why it works and how it doesn't work uh, so I can communicate effectively. And the last thing to say about this is to state the obvious, I suppose, but it needs to be stating is just about everything I'm going to tell you in this video, someone else has already said, right? I mean, social scientists over the last 30 years have systematized it. You know, they've made it more robust, as they say in academia. But fundamentally, everything I'm saying to you was already discovered and developed by Gandhi in the 20th century and then developed by Martin Luther King. So I'm not making any great claims for originality in what I've got to say because if you study history and you study politics you find the same old problems again and again so it's more a matter of rediscovering the past and and updating that so you can inform yourselves and the people you're going to talk to uh, to build this movement to save your generation okay so I'm just going to spend one or two minutes just saying what I'm going to go through. So first of all, I'm going to start with the crisis, uh, the real world as I'm going to call it. And it won't surprise you for to hear me say that I'm going to be making clear that objectively it's a lot worse than we all think. And that's really the emotional basis of the of the other sections. In other words, if you don't emotionally connect with the absolute horror of what's coming down the line, you're not going to be able to engage intellectually with the rest of my presentation because what I'm going to be saying is quite full on about what needs to happen. So we're going to go through that. So even if you think you know the science, you know, it's always important to reacquaint yourself, particularly as every month and year goes by, the situation gets exponentially worse, gets worse at an increased pace. All right, so what I'm going to do then is I'm going to analyze why we've had 30 years of failure. And again, I want to emphasize, and I'll emphasize this several times, I'm not judging people's souls when I'm criticizing particular approaches. I'm criticizing a, a philosophy of action, a way of going about changing the world. And I'm going to be looking at the two main approaches that young people are subjected to, as you might say, when you enter into politics. And the first one, you can call these things different things, but the first one I'm calling the liberal left. So the liberal left is, is what most people have been engaged, young people have been engaged with for the last few decades. And that briefly involves, you know, marches and emailing and petitions and lobbying and it's mainly organized by NGOs. And my proposition, I suppose, is that nothing more dramatic happens because the people that are in charge of those sort of spaces are really there to protect you now rather than protect you in the future. And those two things aren't really compatible in the sense that you have to take risks and put yourself in harm's way now in order to reduce the harm that's coming down the line. So that's a problem, and I'll go into it in more detail. The second sort of approach, I, again, for the sake of argument, I'm calling the radical left. And the radical left is a lot more, as it says, radical. It's a lot more purist. It talks about justice. It talks about more militancy in terms of identity politics and what you have you. And a lot of what it says, as I'm sure we all agree, is spot on. But there's two main problems. The first problem is it's a culture that talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk. In other words, a lot of people in that space, even though they say they support, you know, justice and what have you, are actually quite privileged people, you know, particularly in the elite universities in the global north. And the problem with that is they don't have the credibility to be talking about justice because they don't actually act upon it. And one of the reasons for that, well, two of the reasons for that is because, because they have a purist approach to politics. In other words, if everything isn't exactly perfect, then we don't go ahead and act, which becomes an excuse for not acting, particularly as far as civil disobedience is concerned. 
And the second big problem is that they want to involve everybody in all the decision making as a general rule. And what that does, as I'm sure many of you know, is clogs up decision making. And effective decision making, as we'll come on to discuss, is absolutely essential. There's a little bit of a boring aspect to changing the world, but it's absolutely essential to being effective. So what I'm going to do then is I'm trying to move beyond those two approaches. Often they're juxtaposed to each other, you know, it's like you're in the liberal left or you're in the radical left. I'm saying both of them have failed. And the reason they failed, of course, is because carbon emissions have gone up 60% in the last 30 years. Okay, so then brief, I'm going to go on to action. What action is necessary? And I'm going to talk about civil disobedience, arrest, prison, hunger strikes, uh, criminal damage, uh, and such like, and why that's necessary and how it works. Then I'm going to go on to organisation. So again, I'm going to be moving on from the idea that everyone sits around for hours and end and talks about things and then consults everyone and nothing actually gets done and people get depressed and alienated and leave. So I'm going to talk about how to mobilise people effectively. And then my last section is going to be slightly awkwardly called wisdom and balance. And I'm going to look at the more deeper psychological or spiritual basis for taking action and argue that really, unless you sort your head out, as you might say, in your heart, you're not going to be able to do this work. And there's ways over the last thousands of years, human beings have become more resilient. And I'm going to share some of those ways with you. So I'm just going to finish on what you might call the takeaway message. Maybe there's, there's lots of takeaway messages, but here's one, right? So the takeaway message is, is if you stay within your fears, then you'll fail. And if you become fearless, then you're going to succeed. And courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is deciding there's something more important than fear, which is to get on and do what's necessary. And so my invitation to you is to hold on to that fear, you know, and then give it up and watch the rest of this video. Okay, we'll go on to the next section. Thanks. Okay, so welcome back. <laughs> Here we go, the real world. I'm going to look at the whole climate ecological crisis. I'm going to do it in a particular sort of way. And I guess I'm going to be suggesting that when you communicate it to people you need to communicate it to, you're going to do it in a similar way. And I'm going to give some reasons for that. So I'm just going to jump straight in. So I'm going to start off with the reality, which is the world is a gas chamber. Literally, it's a gas chamber in the sense the atmosphere is there. We depend upon those gases to breathe and to live. And there's no escape. I think that's about as fundamental as it gets in terms of setting the scene. And what we need to understand, of course, is that poisonous gas has been put into the, that gas chamber, into the atmosphere for 200 years now, but at a massive rate for the last 30 years, during which people have well known exactly what the consequences will be. And those consequences are now largely locked in. So what we're talking about here is a murder project, a method of murder, which involves putting a gas that's going to destroy the lives and livelihoods of your generation. And it's important to understand, and I'm going to go into this in more detail, it's important to understand that what the climate means is not icebergs and polar bears. It's what it actually comes out at as, which counts. So what it comes out at how your generation is going to experience it is through war, which means the slaughter and death of people, through starvation, 
not having enough to eat and dying because you don't have enough to eat and rape. That's the reality. And the word that sums it up, which is why I've used this word, is annihilation. Annihilation is a project to murder on a massive scale. And I talked to a London lawyer, and I think this is a good way of summing it up. And he said, there's no greater crime. So what we're seeing here is a project to have billions of people die. It's a project that is knowingly undertaken. So that constitutes mass murder. And it's a crime. It will be and needs to be punished. So once we look at it like that, it all changes, right? It's not something accidental. It's not something about the environment. So that's my proposition. And I'm going to, in the next few minutes, give you the numbers that show that this is actually the case. So the important thing to understand about climate science, as it were, is that you can cherry pick. And that word is thrown around. So I'm going to give a definition of it for you. So cherry pick picking is to choose a stat which isn't the whole picture. You know, you can say, well, it was warm in New York, so climate change isn't happening or something else is happening. So what you want to do is to actually get the bottom line number. So you don't want to know how hot it was that year, this year. You want to know what it's like over the whole world over a long period of time. So let's start off with the temperature. So the temperature now in 2020 is 1.3 degrees above pre-industrial. And I'll explain what these figures mean in a minute. That's a fact. And over the last 10 years, the temperature has increased by 0.3. That's another fact. And the decade before that is it increased by 0.2. So the first thing to establish is we're at 1.3 and it's going to go up by 0.3 at a minimum in the next decade, probably 0.4 because it's going up in an increasing fashion. So the most important calculation for your generation is 1.3 plus 0.3 equals 1.6 over the next five to 10 years. And the reason why that is the most important calculation for your generation, of course, is because for our generation and for the people that run the world, they run on a delusion called the Paris Agreement, which aims to keep the temperature below 1.5. So what we know is we're going over 1.5 in the next five to 10 years. And so we know that the Paris Agreement is wrong. Let's put it like that. Or maybe we should say it's a massive delusion. One way or another, it's irrelevant because those are the numbers. Okay, so let's choose some other numbers. So we're at 415 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere in 2020. That's not quite right because we need to do the carbon in the atmosphere, the CO2 in the atmosphere across all the greenhouse gases, including methane and what have you. If we do that, then it's 500 parts per million. So what does that mean? We know 450 parts per million is two degrees locked in. We also know that 560 parts per million, which we could be passing by the mid-century, will lock in around five degrees temperature increase. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we've done the temperature increase, we've done the parts per million. This is the raw, unavoidable, bottom line killer facts, right? 
So let's do the third killer fact. The Arctic will, the Arctic ice will be melted in the Arctic in the summer by 2035, give or take five to 10 years. So that's a peer reviewed paper. And at the bottom of this video, by the way, you can find some links. So that means two things. Once there's a blue ocean event, as it's called, then the temperature will massively increase in the Arctic because the dark water will absorb heat rather than reflect it as you get on a white surface. This is basic physics. So what that will mean is the temperature difference between the Arctic, which is warmed up, and the equator will be lessened. And what that means is the jet stream, which is the wind that goes around the northern hemisphere, will slow down. And then you get something called weather blocking. What weather blocking means is that you get the same weather for a lot longer because the weather systems are moving more slowly around the Earth. What that means is you're not going to be able to grow crops because what crops need, and I can say with this as a farmer, is a variety of weather. You need it to be sunny and then you need it to be raining and then you need it to be sunny. So if it's like doesn't rain for five, seven, 12 weeks, then you lose the crop. If it rains every day for four, seven, 12 weeks, then you lose all your crops. If it's really hot or really cold or really wet or really dry, you lose your crops. So that's the first problem. The second problem, obviously, is it will increase the temperature of the planet. And the peer reviewed paper this year, and here's the number, is that when the Arctic is melted in the summer by 2035, we're looking at 0.4 of a degree increase in global temperatures as a result of that uh, eventuality. And that's going to happen effectively immediately. The other thing that isn't really talked about but needs to be talked about is global dimming. So what happens, in case you're not aware of this, and this is a real head fuck, <laughs> <laughs> so be prepared if you don't know, is that when you put carbon into the atmosphere through fossil fuels, you also put pollution into the air, small particles, and those particles shade the sun's rays. And what that means is that the full temperature increase is not felt on the Earth's surface because you've got all this pollution in the air. Now, if you stop burning fossil fuels, which obviously you have to do, then that pollution will be reduced. And if there's no fossil fuels, that pollution won't exist at all. Now, if you do that, then there's no small particles shading the Earth from the sun, and the temperature will increase, depending upon which paper you read, between around 0.2 degrees centigrade and 1 degree centigrade. So let's try and average that out and say it's half a degree. Okay, so what we need to understand here and why the younger generation is heading for annihilation is, is because we're heading over two degrees. We've also got the Arctic melting, which takes us to 2.5. We've got the global dimming problem, which takes us towards three degrees. And that seems to be the average. That's not an extreme scenario. I mean, I should say I read two to three science articles a week, and I have done for four or five years now. So this is what you might call the summary, the key unavoidables, as you might say. I'm going to just mention one or two other items because we don't want to be here all day on it. And then I'm going to talk about the implications. So the other things that we need to be aware of is the Greenland ice sheet is going to melt. There's some dispute about whether it's definitely going to melt, but I think it's a fair prediction to say it will melt regardless of whether we reduce carbon emissions to zero. And then there's estimates that that will produce one, two, three meters of sea level rise. Around three meters of sea level rise means that every city on the coast and town on the coast will need to be evacuated later in the century. It's also 
the case that the ice cap in West Antarctica has now passed its tipping point. So again, that's five metres, I think, of sea level rise, seven metres from Greenland. So there's a little bit of a question about it, but it's a fair bet that we're going to have multiple metres of sea level rise by the time you get to old age. The next thing to consider is the Amazon. So again, what's the bottom line figures? 17% cut down or degraded at this point in time in 2021. So I've been trying to ask scientists about this, but it seems like there's a broad consensus, and again, this is in a peer-reviewed paper, that between 20 and 25% of the Amazon being cut down will trigger the destruction and dieback of the Amazon, which of course will raise temperatures even more than what I've just mentioned. And then we could also talk about the acidification of the ocean and the massive increase in forest fires and the warming up of the soils, which incidentally could increase temperatures by up to one degree centigrade over the next 50 years. So we've got a few things that are really clear and then we've got a few wild cards. And the biggest wild card, of course, is methane coming out of the permafrost. So I read recently, for instance, that if 1% of the permafrost escapes, which is a substantial possibility in the next 10 to 20 years, that will increase global temperatures by 1.4 degrees. 0.2 of a degree a year over seven years. Okay, so in most science presentations, you've probably noticed, the scientists will give you this information, but they don't follow the story through. And it's a bit like watching a Hollywood movie, isn't it? And the bad guys are about to win, but you don't find out what the rest of the movie is. So the rest of the movie in this situation is it gets worse and worse. Because what you need to know is what does it actually concretely mean for your lives. So again, I'll give you three or four key statistics. So the first thing to understand is when the scientists say two degrees centigrade, that's the global average figure. I think 66% of the world is covered by ocean. And so most of it is the temperature above the oceans. The fact of the matter is that once you get inland, you have to double that or even triple it. So when you're talking about two degrees centigrade, you're actually talking about an average of four or five or six degrees centigrade in the center of Europe or Africa, the center of the USA or Russia. But that is just the average temperature. So where it gets like horrific is what you consider it will be on a hot day or in a heat wave. So for instance, if it's five degrees centigrade, let's say at two degrees, so it's five degrees in Russia or five degrees in the center of the US, it's a fair bet that it's going to be 10 or 15 degrees over the average for five or six or 10 weeks a year. And if it's that level of temperature, i.e. you know, 30, 40, 50 degrees centigrade, then you'll kill the crops. So that's the reality of two degrees centigrade. So you can look this up at two degrees centigrade, i.e. four degrees in the center of continents, you're looking at losing 20, 30, 40, 50% of your grain production and your corn production on an average year, right? The other thing to consider is the wet bulb effect. So the wet bulb effect is the truly terrifying cliff edge in terms of heat. <clears throat> the important thing to understand about the wet bulb effect is that if your body gets to a certain temperature and the humidity gets to a certain temperature, then regardless of how healthy you are, you'll die within six hours. It's a little bit like hypothermia. If you go out in sub-zero temperatures, then there is a point at which your body freezes and you die. It's the same with heat. And so what the wet bulb effect is, is a combination of humidity and temperature. 
and I think it's something like 35 degrees centigrade, 90% humidity. So as you get up to 40, 50 degrees centigrade, then you're facing what is euphemistically called mass mortality events, i.e. thousands or even millions of human beings dying in two or three days. And that's what's coming down the line as we start approaching 40, 50 degrees because the temperature's risen over two degrees. <clears throat> what this concretely means is, according to one paper, is that two degrees centigrade, or maybe by 2050, there will be 1,000 million migrants on the move. And they'll be on the move because they can't grow food, because there's been famines and the things that famines lead to, which is mass slaughter and collapse of social systems and rape. And so the main scenario, the main annihilation scenario, is as we head over four degrees centigrade, which could be happening by mid-century or later in the century, then half the world is going to be uninhabitable. That's a firm, peer-reviewed prediction. Four degrees centigrade, half the world uninhabitable or uninhabitable for at least six months of the year which in my book means uninhabitable. And what that means is, as has been predicted by the Potsdam Institute people, on and off record now, I think, that we're looking at a small number of people surviving a mass death event, a mass annihilation, a mass extinction event of the human race. And some estimates say there'll be one billion people crowded around the two poles in Northern Europe or in Southern uh, Africa and Australia and such like, because everyone else will have died. That's the situation. And just to finish off this section, we need to also understand that this catastrophe in life has happened many times before, arguably five times before in the Earth's history when 70, 80, 90% of all life on Earth has died due to the release primarily of carbon and methane, sometimes through volcanic uh, eruptions. And this is probably the most important statistic in my view, is the rate at which we're putting carbon into the atmosphere as you watch this video is 20 to 30 times faster than the rate at which carbon was put into the atmosphere through those volcanoes and what have you 30, 50 million years ago, which resulted in 90, 95% of all life on Earth um, dying, the great dying events or the great extinction episodes in the Earth's history. Okay. So what I want to do next is to communicate again what this really looks like for many of you, the young people who are going to experience this level of catastrophe. And I think an important thing to communicate is that when social collapse happens, there's two aspects to it. When you're in a war, there's two aspects. And the two aspects are chronic dullness and boredom and absolute terror. So 99% of the time, your life is reduced, impoverished, nothing much is happening. And if you want to get an idea of what that feels like, then you know what it's like because we've just had a year of COVID. In other words, we're looking at a repetition of COVID-esque events so that all the good things of life start to get reduced because you can't move, because you haven't got the money, because there aren't the health services, because social disruption is happening, you can't get abroad, you can't do all the things that you are brought up to think you would be able to do. And then the other thing that social breakdown brings is terror, literally terror. And what I mean by terror is, is the sudden facing of death. And... There's two aspects I can talk about here. 
one of the things about food crises, which basically trigger terror events, is they come suddenly. You'll be going into the supermarket one day and there'll be stuff there and then the food system will collapse and suddenly there'll be less food. And again, many of you have seen this in COVID, that produces a panic. And what will happen is one week the bread will be there, the next week the bread won't be there and someone will be paying, you know, $50, 50 pounds for it in the car park. And two or three weeks later, there'll be dead bodies in the car park because someone's so hungry that they'll kill people. And that happens very rapidly and is confirmed by the literature, the people that write about social collapse. The other thing about social collapse is the complete loss of material security or law and order, as you might say. So what will happen is episodes where someone, a gang of young men, come into your house, they take your girlfriend, they take your mother, they put her onto the table and they gang rape you, her in front of you. And then after that, they take a hot stick and they poke out your eyes and they blind you. That's the reality of the annihilation project that you face. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because, first of all, we need to understand and you need to understand the actuality, the reality of what we face, because it's owed to you. And as you know, the climate change movement over the last 10, 20, 30 years has not told the truth. And as I'll come on to explain, unless you feel the horror and terror of what I've just said, you're not going to gain the strength in order to prevent or reduce that potentiality, that potential. So maybe you want to take a break now and think about what I've said, maybe come back and at any point take a break because it's going to be a long video and then we'll talk about what we need to do. Okay, so what does this practically mean? What it practically means is this annihilation event, this extinction event, well, I'm going to call it annihilation because it's a conscious project by people who know what they're doing. There's two things that need to happen. First of all, carbon emissions need to be reduced to zero in a matter of months or a few years. And secondly, the reality is we've left it too late in order to not be able to deal with what's coming without geoengineering. I'm not going to go into it because it's not really my field or my expertise, but though that is the dual agenda for your generation. And what we, you need to communicate to other people is these three aspects that what we're dealing with is universal, is going to affect everyone on the planet. It's existential. It's going to lead to mass death, potentially a million people being left on the planet by the late century. And it's existential, which means the rate at which it's getting worse is increasing. And it's that last aspect which needs to thrust you into taking high risk, high return action, as I call it. In other words, gradualism and reformism is out of the question because of the physics. And what that practically means is you have to take control over the state. The state is the only institution in societies that is capable of creating a rapid transition through telling industry and people what to do. This always happens in emergencies. It's a golden rule of history and sociology that the state needs to be controlled and the state needs to be used in order to enact these two things. Research into geoengineering and enactment of that and, and reducing carbon emissions to zero. 
So that's what we're going to focus on when we talk about what to do about it. And I'm just going to finish by trying to put what I've said into some sort of perspective. And as I said at the beginning of my talk, like, you're not the only generation that's faced annihilation. My generation had to face it with the, the, with the, um, the nuclear holocaust situation. But of course, with your generation, it was different to mine because with my generation, something had to happen. With your generation, nothing needs to happen for this to happen, as you might say. But it's worthwhile considering that for 99% of human history, you know, 10, 15% of the population would die in violent circumstances like the one I've just described. And people used to live around 20, 30 years. So what we're facing here is not a catastrophe, you know, everything's been fine and then we're going into these, this depth. What's happened is for most of human history, people have lived these terrible, short, brutish lives, as the phrase goes. And all that's happening now is we're returning to that catastrophic way of life that humans suffered in before 100, you know, 200 years ago. So that's the task. And for the rest of this video, I'm going to be talking about what to do. Thanks. Okay, so the next two sessions, this session and the next session, is dealing with why things have gone wrong, why things don't work, and the reasons for that. And the bottom line here is lots of people have been trying to deal with this crisis for 30 years now, and they've been engaged in a number of methods and approaches. And my proposition to you, what my argument to you is, if someone tries to do something for 30 years and they fail, in fact, they catastrophically fail, regardless of how nice they are or how hard they work, the fact of the matter is their method of dealing with the problem isn't going to work. And the bottom line here, as I've said earlier in the talk, is carbon emissions have gone up 60% globally. All right, so... What I'm going to say here is there's two approaches. There's been two approaches over the last 30 years. And these two approaches are being sold, as you might say, to young people today. And what I want to communicate is they're not going to work and you don't want to pursue them. So by the liberal left, which is the first approach, I'm really talking about the NGOs, the green parties, the campaign groups, the local environmental campaigns and such like. And all those, all those groups and all those approaches have a few catastrophic things in common. So the first thing is they're never clear about what's going on. You, you're not going to hear the chief executive of Greenpeace talk about rape in your kitchen. They're not even going to talk about rape. They're, you'll be lucky if they're going to talk about social class. What they're mainly going to talk about are what are called general abstractions, like it's game over for the climate, or we're going to lose the planet, or the collapse of civilization. These things sound nice and semi-comfortable, abstract, weird, nothing to do with me. And the reason for that, of course, is because they're emotionally repressed. They can't handle the emotional reality of what's going to be happening. In other words, they're lying to you because they're saying something is something, they're saying something is not what it is, right? And what they'll say to you, of course, is that they're protecting you. They have this phrase, duty of care. We can't tell teenagers what's going on. 
And of course, as far as I can see, teenagers know they're lying because human beings are pretty good at working that out. And that leads to depression and disgust and alienation. So that's like the first major problem with these people. So the second thing that's almost religious with these sorts of people is the absolute necessity to have hope. And again, what you probably noticed in how I described the crisis in the last section is I haven't talked about hope. I've talked about the situation and what needs to happen. Hope doesn't really come into it. And the problem with hope, of course, is it's a way of covering up what's actually going on. The fact of the matter is, is this annihilation project is now locked in. People that live on hope have been denying the reality now for 10 or 20 years. There's still a question of how much annihilation and whether it will be terminal. But the fact is, the climate crisis is now locked in. We're going to head over 1.5 degrees. You know, when Fridays for a Future, for instance, does a campaign, as I understand they are doing, saying 1.5, let's stay below 1.5, that's really a function of what you might call the ideology of hope. In other words, we're not looking at the science. What we're looking at is what we want to see happen and then pretend that it is possible when it self-evidently is not. So the first step to what you might call sustainable activism is to look the reality in the face and realise there is no hope at this stage of stopping the climate crisis. There may be some possibility of stopping its extremities, as you might say. But that's where we're at. I mean, I'll say I'm 54, so I've been in this for quite a long time. And in the 1990s, the NGOs were saying, and the diplomats were saying, if we go over one degree centigrade, then it's game over. Sort of, there'll be no hope. And then it went over one degree centigrade. And they used to say, if we go over 350 parts per million, then it's game over. And then we went over 350 parts per million. And then they changed their tune. And in 2009, after the Copenhagen conference, they'd say, there's still hope as long as we reduce carbon emissions by 2015. And we didn't reduce carbon emissions in 2015. And here we are in 2021, with the NGOs getting Fridays for a Future to say, it's fine, there's still time to stop 1.5 degrees from happening. There isn't. What we're talking about here is raw, basic physics. And physics doesn't lie. It's not a social construction, as you might say. So what lies behind this inability to look at reality and inability to communicate effectively is another ideology, and that's the ideology of progress. So just about all middle-class adults, particularly in the global north, are addicted to this basic religious idea, which is all societies progress. They want, aren't so bad, they get better, and they continue to get better. This is complete nonsense. Societies collapse on a regular basis throughout history. There's nothing unusual about that. As I said, annihilation events happen regularly. The unique aspect of this annihilation event is it has the potentiality to destroy all of humanity for the first time. And what is enormously difficult for these people is to conceive that possibility. And if you challenge them, as maybe some of you have, then they get terribly upset because you're questioning their most basic beliefs. So what we have here really is an insidious denial, in many ways far worse than the denial of the deniers, right, on the other side of the fence, as you might say. Because what this leads to is an inertia, like nothing can really happen because it's not really that bad. And this notion, which originated in the 1990s, that climate change is an issue. It's a problem to be sorted out. Well, we know it's not climate change. We know it's a climate crisis or climate catastrophe. Climate change, if you're not aware, was created by people in the corporate class to make it sound slightly comforting and not much of a big deal. So it's a crisis and it's here 
and it's locked in. In other words, what we need to understand and what the liberal class resists is it's a systematic problem, which means it's foundational. If the climate goes, everything else goes, from going to the opera, to going to a football match, to your prospects of having children, through to having a government, everything, every single thing, all the social progress of the last 200 years, all the lives of struggle that went into improving life are going to disappear in the next 10 years. In other words, it's a little bit like society and everything in it is a table, right? What's on top of a table, rather? There's the plates and there's the dinner and there's the knives and there's forks. And the climate is the table. And when you cut off the legs of the table, when you destroy the Amazon, that's one of the legs, when you destroy the Arctic, the whole fucking thing collapses, right? In one go. So that's the way we need to think about it. And of course, that's not the way the liberal class looks upon it. They sort of glaze over when you tell them about this. And another important thing to understand about what you might call the global north middle class domination of the climate industry or the climate movement is it's dominated by middle class people who live comfortable lives and arguably are incapable of conceiving what social collapse looks like because it's not in their experience. Nothing terrible has happened to them. So what does all this lead to is a theory of change, as it were, a strategy of change which promotes symbolic victories, symbolic action. So you have this lie about the climate and you have a lie around what progress looks like. So the important thing to understand about political change is it's not symbolic. If you want to sort out the climate crisis, what you want is a reduction in carbon emissions. That's the bottom line. Shaking hands with the head of the UN, talking to politicians, appearing on the media, having banner drops, that's not what you're doing. You're trying to get a reduction in carbon emissions. So all those things that pretend to be victories aren't in victories at all. And if you engage in what produces real change, i.e. direct action, civil resistance, civil disobedience, then what these people will say to you is you're upsetting people and, quote, as happened at King's College, you're shutting down the conversation. But the reality is, and this is one of the most important things I want to communicate, is the, commun the conversation was never getting you anywhere in the first place. In other words, you only get a real conversation when you upset your opponents and they sit down and take you seriously. In other words, this is the definition of resistance in a historical sense. You know, the sort of thing that happened in the 20th century. And this liberal class has no appreciation and no real understanding of political history. It very much assumes that everything that's happened over the last 30 years is how everything's always been. In fact, the last 30 years have been an aberration. In other words, it's an exception in history. Most of history is full of wars and revolutions and social collapse and resistance and mass slaughter and victories and, you know, this is the horror and glory of history, as it were. And so what we need to do is forget about the liberal class and their very, you know, nonsensical, unfounded notion of what history looks like and start reading the history books ourselves. And we can look, for instance, at how real change works. So an example of real change is the Children's March in the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. And what you see there is the liberal class saying, no, 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 we don't want children and young people going to the streets and putting, being put into harm's way because for all the reasons we're told today. But they ignored that advice and they went into the streets and they made a significant political change over two or three weeks. And similarly, if you watch the children, the Freedom Riders, both of these things are internet, I think there'll be links to them below this video, 
with the Freedom Riders, that was a bunch of young people saying, we're going to go onto buses into the, into the Deep South in the United States and, and break the law on people of different races being able to sit next to get each other on a coach. Now, what we need to understand about that is that was massively unpopular by what you might call the liberal civil rights movement, but they did it anyway, and they made a massive advance in civil rights. So this is a theme throughout history, right? The liberal class basically smothering radical realist action, as it were, has always been a theme. And if you want to sort of read an example of how this works, then you can read Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail. And in that, he makes clear that the biggest block, the biggest block in the liberation of the black people in the South of the United States was not the Ku Klux Klan, was not the conservatives. It was the liberal class that took energy away from activism and diverted it into ways of working which simply don't work. And what we need to look at instead of that symbolic gradualist reformist action is revolutionary action that takes control of the state in the absolute emergency we're in and then uses the state to enact the legislation necessary to reduce carbon emissions to zero and to make geoengineering work. That's the agenda that I suggest we're looking at. Okay, so this section is about the radical left. Again, like the liberal left, it covers a multitude of sins, as you might say. It's a broad category, but it's a particular sort of number of different approaches to social change and activism, which I want to look at. Um, it's been going on a bit like the liberal left for about 30 years, and it's been very much involved in approaches that have failed as we've just discussed. And in some ways, the radical left is a more important impediment or block to effective change than the liberal left, or at least I suspect it will become so over the next year or two, because as young people are largely dominated by the liberal left through the NGOs and what have you, they'll increasingly realise just through experience about how hopeless that theory of change is, and that will open them up to radicalisation. This happens many, many times in social movements. You know, young people come in and then they gradually radicalise and then you might call that, might say they over-radicalise. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit more time looking at why this, broadly speaking, is a false approach in terms of effective action. So... To sum up, really, in a rather crude way, what the radical left does is they talk great talk, but they don't walk the walk. In other words, you use lots of radical people around, as I'm sure you're aware, who will say all the right things about justice and solidarity and intersectionality and identity. And it's undeniably great stuff. It's exactly what we should be doing. But saying something doesn't mean it's happening. And if it's not happening, it doesn't actually mean anything in terms of improving people's lives or preventing this catastrophe. In other words, having the right analysis has no necessary relationship between that and actually changing the world. Another way of saying it is, just because someone says they're into social justice or into justice doesn't mean they're a just person and doesn't mean they're bringing about social justice. I mean, if you think about it in terms of products, just because someone says something about a product doesn't mean it's going to happen. You're going to have to test it. You need to look at it. You need to look at their record. So let's do that. So, there's... A, there's a number of reasons why the radical left results in the collapse of effective action. 
And what I sort of want to say about this is, although the radical left claims to be radical, it's largely made up, or the main people who influence it, are largely made up from the same social and political class as people from the liberal left. In other words, privileged people in the global north, many of whom are at the elite universities. And what I'd like to suggest, I suppose, is that because this approach has been happening for 30 years, it's completely compatible with the neoliberal political system. In other words, the system that's taking us to destruction. And I think the reason why that is the case is because the radical left is mainly focused on language politics. In other words, what you say. And to be blunt, the economic system that we face doesn't give a damn about words. What it gives a damn about is material disruption. So that's the real fundamental reason why the radical left never gets anywhere and is a distraction. Now, having said that, obviously, the words people use are enormously important and it's a part of the general discussion, but it's not the main show because words and language, as I say, are largely symbolic. It's about how people feel about things rather than what's actually happening, such as carbon being put into the atmosphere. And that's why the radical left, as I say, is largely compatible with this murderous system because at the end of the day, it's a liberal proposition. It doesn't actually challenge the powers that be. But it's more insidious than that because it destroys social movements. And the reason and the way it does that is through judgment of others. In other words, what it does is it individualizes struggle down into individual behavior. It's not looking at the structural reasons why there's inequality or injustice. It's looking at particular individuals and judging them for not using the right language or the right approach. And what this does is creates a purist culture. And not only does that make people very upset and alienated and push people out of movements, it also stops movements from engaging in mass mobilization. Because what mass mobilization means is attracting a lot of people that don't know the right language rules and the purest politics of the people that are at the elite universities that claim to speak for the oppressed. One sort of classic aspect of it is that this culture is puritanical, Calvinistic and humorless. While most normal people, dare I say it, do want to have a bit of a laugh every now and again. But if you try and have a laugh in these circles, then often that's tantamount to being, you know, wrong and judged and all the rest of it. And what this leads to as a final analysis, as it were, is people in those groups start to attack each other because, in a rather sort of surreal and bizarre way, there's no end point to purism. You know, everyone's a little bit racist if you look hard enough. So people start accusing each other in these groups of being more racist or more sexist or more anti this or anti that. And what happens is they start shooting each other, as it were, and the group gets smaller and smaller and the whole thing collapses. So this isn't new, dare I say it. Radical politics for hundreds of years has been blighted by this continual problem. And there's an underlying structure to how it has power. And that's the power, as you might say, of logic. It's a little bit like you're racist, so you need to stop. And then you stop being racist. And then someone says to you, well, you're not anti-racist enough. And before you know it, you have to become more and more pure. And, and this empowers extreme people who can guilt trip other people in the space. So a little example of this, just to show this isn't unique, is in the 1970s, the big sort of guilt tripping extreme left, as it were, was what you might call the hard left. They were communists, and, but they used the same technique. 
So in the 1970s, there would be what you might call extreme Maoists. And their general line was not to accuse people of sexism or racism. They would accuse people of being bourgeois. But the same thing worked. So they'd go to students in northern universities, like the Christian student movement that I was part of, and they'd said, unless you support us, you know, in various third world liberation movements, then you're bourgeois. And bourgeois was a bit like being cancelled. It was, you know, the most terrible thing out there. And then what that led to was sort of naive, guilt-stricken, middle-class, nice people, students in the global north, supporting movements and episodes in the global south, which were effectively fascistic and genocidal. And this, this led, in the late 70s, to the Christian student movement that I was involved in, supporting the Khmer Rouge. And if you haven't heard of the Khmer Rouge, these were extreme communists, you might want to describe them like that, or left-wing fascists, and they killed 25% of the Cambodian population in two or three years. So that was not too good, let's put it like that. So what we need to establish in dealing with the radical left is this notion that no one's perfect and everyone's welcome despite their imperfections. In other words, we need to introduce some compassionate sort of culture in radical circles. And there is that quote from Jesus or, you know, in the New Testament, isn't there, of saying, whoever's without sin throws the first stone. And that's one key approach to deal with this problem. OK, but there's a sort of added problem here, which is these approaches lead to the reduction and the liberalisation of radical action. And there's two sort of moves here. The first move the radical left uses is to say people will get hurt. You know, people get beaten up in prison, etc., etc. In other words, if some people will get hurt, then we shouldn't do it because we're going to exclude people. Now, the closer you look at this argument, the more obvious it becomes a reactionary argument, a liberal argument, because all through history, the people who've rebelled have been fully aware that they may get hurt. And of course, they've decided to put themselves into danger's way because they're going to get hurt anyway. They're going to get hurt in many ways, even worse than taking the risk of engaging in civil resistance. In other words, what the radical left does is sort of fetishizes safety and fetishizes participation to the extent that it stops radical action from happening. Radical action, by definition, involves the possibility of getting hurt. And the sort of another element of this is the notion you have to involve everyone. And if you don't involve everyone, then you're being exclusive and patriarchal and various other nasty things that they're going to throw at you. Now, the fact of the matter is that all effective direct action is exclusive because not everyone can participate in various forms of civil disobedience and civil resistance. I mean, you can have an array of different things, but there's no question that everybody can do everything, nor should everybody do everything for obvious reasons. But the proposition, of course, is unless you've consulted these groups and unless you've involved everybody, then the action shouldn't go ahead. So what it means is not only do you just get liberal actions, as you might say, you just get less of them because it's so difficult to come to a consensus. So the upshot of it, this, is that the radical left, in actuality, produces action that's no more radical than the liberal left. If you actually look at what actually happens with the radical left, they'll do the same things, which is marches and discussion groups and statements of solidarity and all the rest of the stuff, which is pretty meaningless when you're dealing with an existential emergency that we are now. And of course, the problem here is that most people in these political circles, in these political cultures, do not accept, do not emotionally engage with the actuality of what's going to happen to your generation. And that the heart of it is they don't want to because, of course, they don't have the courage because they're basically privileged people who don't need to engage with it because they're in the global north in elite circles. 
So what we really need to be moving on to in terms of dealing with this is the following proposition, which is if you're actually really interested in justice, if you want social justice, if you want to show solidarity with the peoples of the global south, you have to emotionally engage with the full criminality of what's happening, which is a genocide project against billions of people. Now, if that is true, which it self-evidently is true, then if you've got any consistency or morality or political credibility, you have to engage in civil resistance. Civil resistance, as we'll come on to discuss, is the material, right, note, the material disruption of the oppressor, of the regime that is facilitating genocide. In other words, you have to block the roads, glue yourself to doors, go on hunger strike, go and disrupt railway lines, whatever it is, right? That's, there's a whole array of things people do in a civil resistance process. And what that results in, of course, is you going to prison or getting arrested. And in other words, this whole sort of hesitancy around, oh, jail is a tactic or arrest is a tactic and it excludes people that are oppressed is nonsense. It's actually the only thing in a crisis situation that is going to remove the oppression. So, in other words, if you're not arrested and you're not put in prison, then you're not resisting. And if you're not resisting, you're part of the problem. You're appeasing the evil and obscenity of the injustice that we face at this point in time. So what we need to do with the radical left is engage in a debate, an open debate with them in order to make these arguments, which as far as I can see, are no brainers. What we're dealing with is something beyond evil and it needs to be dealt with through civil resistance. And of course, the main aspect one of the main aspects of the radical left is they never want radical, they never want open debate because people might get hurt. That's the excuse. The real reason the radical left doesn't want open debate is because they're going to lose it because they rely upon, you know, a false ideology that doesn't work when the closer you look at it. So what we need to move on to, of course, is action that actually works and only action that works is moral and effective of course so that's what we're going to do next back again how are you doing uh we, we're, we're we're getting through this aren't we <laughs> action so this section is on action so we're actually going to look here at, okay, so we dealt with all the problems, you know, the ideas, philosophies, whatever, that don't work. So what does work? How are we going to minimise the horrendous situation that's coming down the line? Okay, so point number one, what changes the world is action, right? Action means moving your body and doing stuff. It doesn't mean talking online, it doesn't mean social media, it doesn't mean uh, symbolic, shaking hands with people and all the rest of it. Okay, so I've been involved in designing civil disobedience on and off for 30 years and building social movements. So this is my bottom line, <laughs> which is action creates mobilisation. So a lot of people, including a lot of young people, go, okay, we want to get things on the go, we need to mobilise lots of people. And they try and mobilise lots of people. No, that's not the right way to do it. The right way to do it is as soon as there's one of you, two of you, five of you, then you go out and do an action. Because it's the action that then creates the mobilisation. In other words, unless you prove your worth, as you might say, in public life or in the public sphere or on social media, by actually walking the talk, then no one's really going to be bothered. But if you go off and do transgressive stuff, then suddenly all these people come out of the woodwork. So the bottom line phrase, I suppose, of this section is just do it, which I know is a cliche, but it's true. Just go and do it. OK, so what are you going to do? So the next essential point is you have to break the law. 
don't let anyone tell you that you're going to get anywhere by not breaking the law. And incidentally, of course, breaking the law is their framing, right? The opposition's framing. What you're doing is upholding the law by breaking the law because their laws are illegal. So always bear that in mind when you go to court and what have you. So what does this actually mean in terms of effectiveness? So the thing about breaking the law is it disrupts the political social space, as you might say. In other words, people take notice because number one, you've broken the law, which is unusual. And number two, through breaking the law, you're usually disrupting something, sitting on a road or painting a building or gluing yourself to a door or something like that. So people give you their attention. And attention, we need to understand attention is the first step in political change or attitude change. Unless you've got the attention, nothing's going to happen. That's pretty obvious, right? So how does that work? So the real fundamental thing that separates people that are engaged in effective action and the liberal and radical left is those guys think when you upset people, then you're not going to bring about change. In actuality, it's the other way around. Only by upsetting people through nonviolent disruption do you open up the potentiality, the potential of creating change. So let me say that again. If you're just having a conversation, right, sitting in committees, nothing changes because no one's threatened. No one's being forced to do anything. No one's being forced to talk about a subject. When you engage in upsetting people, then you have the potential for change. In other words, they may not, they may not come on your side, but it's a lot more likely they will because they're being forced to think about the immoral and crap things they're doing. So that's the essence of classical nonviolence. And classical nonviolence in the Martin Luther King Gandhian tradition is the most effective way of bringing about that change because of that mechanism. So in other words, like it creates a big debate. You know, the newspapers are talking about it. You know, 80% of people hate you, so what, right? In 1961, Martin Luther King was the most unpopular man in America, right? Because he was disrupting the immorality of white people. And he was doing that through disruptive illegal action. So that's what young people do. The adults and the older people and the people in control don't give a flying shit, right, about you unless you're there disrupting them. And if you want a little quote on this, you know, there's Larry Kramer with the ACT UP movement in the late 80s, early 90s, and they went around doing whatever was necessary in order to stop gay people dying of AIDS. They went and closed down the stock exchange, they shut down the Catholic Cathedral in New York, they threw the ashes of their lovers over, dead lovers over the gates uh, fence of the White House, they showed the dead bodies to the press, they did whatever it took. And this was their approach, right? So this is a quote from Larry Kramer. We didn't give a flying fuck what people thought of us, and that was our strength. So that's, that's the way to do it, if you're interested in minimizing the annihilation of your generation. Okay, so we need to be a little bit more sophisticated about how this works. And one of the things people forget about classical civil disobedience is that it's got two sides. It's got the disruption, you want to go and create hell, and equally importantly, you have to show respect to the opposition. Now, a lot of people think this is a little bit hippie or soft or liberal. It's not. It's realist. If you want to get a deal with the opposition, then you have to enable them to save face. Enabling the opposition to save face means you don't attack them as individuals. You don't abuse them. You don't insult them, right? Much as you might like to, because it's not smart, okay? What you do is you show them respect. You're calm, you're diplomatic, you're respectful, and you don't compromise. You know, if you look at a well-trained union leader or civil rights leader, that's what they do. It's what we call, you know, at the beginning of Extinction Rebellion, maximum disruption, maximum love. The two things go together. 
And a third element, and an overall element here, which again people don't really understand about classical nonviolence, is the thing that really drives it, right? The thing that drives that breaking the law and showing respect is a total fearlessness. Fearlessness is the central attitude that changes society. And what I mean by fearlessness is do what the fuck you like to me and I don't care. And this is often and, you know, not often, just about always misunderstood by what you might call the radical left or the liberal left or whatever. Because what they think is, is that you need to protect yourself and you have to be closed and secretive. No, if you want to create a mass movement, if you want thousands of kids on the street, right, you have to have leaders that go out there and say fuck you to the opposition and do what you like. And that might mean they get hurt, it might mean they're put in prison. And that very process creates the backfiring effect, which then brings thousands of kids out or thousands of people onto the street. That's how it works. So don't get it into your head, right, that civil disobedience or nonviolence is pretty. There's nothing pretty about it. Look at the children's march videos, right? There's loads of kids there and half of them are getting like thrown down the street by the hoses. It involves bringing the intrinsic violence of the opposition out into the open. In other words, like the racism in that situation was implicit. People didn't see it. But when they saw kids getting like eaten by dogs and what have you in the street, that's when the nation woke up because it was there in their face. Bang, right? And it's the same way with climate crisis. You know, everyone thinks, yeah, it's a problem. A bit like they used to think with racism in the 60s. And it's like out there, but no one gives a shit. And it's like you're out there and a few hundred kids have gone to prison or whatever. It's in their face. It's the, on the front page of the newspapers. You know, like when we had the April 2019 rebellion in the UK, 1,200 arrests. It was global news. And what you need to understand as young people is you have massive power, right? Massive power, a lot more power than I have because young people are like, photogenic you know they're sexy they're the people people take notice of you know if you've got a bunch of kids getting arrested it's worth a thousand adults because it's visual and people go what the hell you know there's these people these kids saying get this sorted out because we're over it and that's how it works okay so one of the things you want to consider when you're designing an action and this is a rule of thumb is the most powerful thing you can do to bring about political change is to take your plan and times it by three. Now, that might sound a bit weird. Maybe it's two, maybe it's five. The point is you take your plan and it's never gonna be good enough, right? What you wanna do is consciously make it lots more full on. So for instance, like if you're gonna have a Fridays for Future strike, right? And you're gonna go on strike for a day. No one gives a damn as everyone knows. What you want to do is go on strike like three or four days a week and that will have what's called a non-linear effect. In other words, the people will, the police will be coming to your houses and dragging you out of the house and that will be in the press. So, you know, just not going to school one day a week, no one gives a damn. Two days a week, you're going to get in the local papers. Three days a week, you're going to be, you know, on the regional news. Four days a week, and a month of doing it, you're going to be international. And that's how you create the change, right? So it's the same like with a hunger strike. You know, if you're on hunger strike for three days, no one gives a damn. Seven days, you know, maybe it's news. If you're on hunger strike for 14, 21 days, you're going to be in the national headlines. That's how you do it. So you need to have the courage and ruthlessness and fearlessness to go, okay, we're doing this. Who said three days? We're going to do it for nine days, right? You know, Dum, 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 dum. Now, what you'll find, as you're probably thinking when I'm saying this, is lots of people won't want it to happen, right? So some people in the meeting will go, well, you know, two days, that's okay. Six days, that's too frightening. What you've got to do is say to those people, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. In other words, all radical effective action is based upon the following principle, which is the alliance of the willing. In other words, if you don't want to do it, that's fine. But you can't veto us doing it. 
because if you have them vetoing what you can do, then that leads to lowest common denominator actions. In other words, actions which are useless. So there's two possibilities. You either stay in the organisation or the network or whatever, and they allow you to do your Alliance of the Willing action, or very politely, you leave the organisation or network and set up a new one, which is one of the things that's happened with last generation that I'm starting to help sort out at the moment. So then the idea is, it doesn't matter that you're small, right? Never worry about being small. As we've said, it's action that creates mobilization, right? And it's dramatic action that creates the most mobilization. So the real determinant here is how radical your action is. And an important aspect of this is what you might call the materiality of civil resistance. So that's a bit of a mouthful. But what I mean by that is you have to have a real eagle eye attitude towards this question. Is the action real or is it symbolic? You know, symbolic action is action which doesn't actually slow down the economy. It's slowing down the economy or bringing the economy to the halt which brings about political change. That's the fundamental notion of system change or revolution historically. So that's why in civil resistance episodes, particularly in the global south, everyone goes to the capital city and they stay there day after day after day so that the costs to the government go up exponentially. You know, two or three days, no one gives a damn. Five days, yeah, it's a big deal. Two weeks, you bring down the government. That's how it works. So you need to focus on that. So the opposite of that is pure symbolic action, as I've said, you know, going to the UN and shaking hands with some dignitary, being invited to Davos, you know, going on some, you know, TV show. It's all good stuff, right? But none of it is going to produce political change by itself. The thing that produces the change is the disruptive action, the material disruption to the economy. Okay. So the other thing which sort of leads on to this, and this is the thing that those of you who are quite strategic watching this need to communicate to other young people, is the only way this is going to get sorted out is by taking control of the state or influencing the state in a strategic way. And by the state, I mean a government, right? And what that means is two things, is this material disruption that forces a government to act and standing in elections so that you can take over the state. Now, obviously, standing in elections sounds a little bit weird because most people think they should be protesting. No, right? All revolutionary movements in history generally have a dual strategy, which is mass civil resistance, right, street politics and people standing in elections and getting into assemblies and then taking over the state. Because the thing to emphasise here is that in the emergency, as I think I've said earlier, in an emergency, the state takes over from the economy. This is an essential political thing to understand. The, the climate emergency is not going to be sorted out by forcing Shell to move to new renewable energy. It's not going to be created by closing down coal mines. It's going to be created by taking control of the state and then the state legislating. And that legislation will close all the coal mines, right? You know, it will shut down all the oil companies. You see what I mean? So you're going for the core of the power of the system and then through that control, you can enact the rapid political change that we need. Okay, so needless to say, just to finish off on this, the people on the radical left and the people on the liberal left will hate what you're doing. And the reason for that is nothing to do with politics. It's to do with jealousy. Because if you get involved in political action, you soon realise it's full of egotism, right? It's, we're dealing with human beings here. And what they will do is make up lots of political excuses for why what you're doing doesn't work, or it hasn't worked well enough, or they'll suggest sort of generalised criticisms. Now, that's part of the job, right? There's two, always two oppositions when you're changing the world. There's the bad guys, and then there's the people on your own side 
that are trying to undermine what you do because they're threatened by your success and your fearlessness. And the way to approach that is, first of all, to accept its inevitability. There will always be a load of shit coming to you from your own side. And the way to respond to that is with a smile on your face, right? Which is to say, thank you very much and carry on doing it. In other words, don't get embroiled in a whole load of internal politics. You know, if the organisation you're in doesn't like it, then leave, right? And set up a new one and get on with it. Because in the social media age, you can create a civil resistance event in three to six months, right? It's not difficult. There's ways of doing it. So that's the general rule of thumb, of course, is once you step into this resistance, once you actually overcome your fears, once you join with other people that are resisting, it's an ecstatic experience, right? For years, you felt miserable, depressed, you know, traumatized, all the rest of it. And then suddenly, you had a bunch of people going, fuck it, let's do it. And that's going to cheer you up. And then when you go into the field of battle, put that smile on your face because there's nothing more subversive than enjoying resistance. Okay, so on to organisation. Speeding through. <laughs> organisation, what can you say? What I can say about organisation is if you want to affect change the world and bring about all this change then the people that are most successful at it are the people that focus on organization like most of my time is about developing organizational structures so this isn't very sexy but for those of you that are serious about the horror that's coming down the line you have to become disciplined about focusing on how things work and making sure those things work well because you'll never be successful unless you have organisational coherence behind all the great actions and all the rest of it. And there's a whole bunch of different elements there that I'm going to start talking to you about. So don't skip this section, right? This is the section where those of you that are really serious about what needs to be done need to be taking notes and learning about some super basic errors that take place in social movements and networks, particularly over the last 20, 30 years. Now, I'll say this now and I'll say it at the end as well, right? Human beings, as we all know, are tricky, right? <laughs> There's no perfect organisational model. There's just some models that are really bad and other models that get you along, as you might say. So, um, okay, so what I'm going to say is the other thing about social change is that just about all social change is initiated by small groups of people. So this is a very empowering evidence, as it were. You don't have to have this big mass movement, or at least not straight away. The people that really influence things are usually in tight, highly organised, high trust teams that have worked together for a year or two. So that's what you want to be creating, is getting together with a bunch of people and you stress test things by going into actions, doing projects, and you learn about each other and, you know, with strengths and weaknesses and your different personalities. And the great thing about a well-functioning team is that everyone's got different strengths, right? We all know that, you know, I'm good at some things, I'm really bad at other things, same with other people. So people come forward and do different stuff. But that team needs to work together for a long time, six months, a year, two years, and then interesting things start happening. And that's how history has changed. You may know the quote, you know, only a small group of people change the world and that's the only way the world is changed, or words to that effect. Okay, so the biggest structural problem about social movements and networks and radical politics and all the rest of it over the last 30 years has been what I call the disaster of horizontalism. Now, horizontalism is a 
particular theory of organization and its general proposal is that you don't need leaders. Leadership is a bad thing and you want to involve lots of people in the decisions, right? Now, obviously, that, those two points have got a lot going for it, but the problem is that, that becomes moralized. In other words, it becomes dogmatic. It's like having a leader per se is bad all the time. It becomes ideological. You've got to involve everybody, and then you've got to involve everybody who you didn't think of involving, right? It becomes extreme, rigid, moralistic. Now, one of the things that's in support of the horizontalist idea is that it's extremely effective at building mobilizations because no one has to check with each other. There's no hierarchy. Everyone just goes and do, does it. And, you know, it's got a lot of advantages. The problem, though, is with most big revolts and, you know, mobilizations and what have you over the last 20, 30 years, is they're fueled by this horizontalist social movement sort of uh, social media fueled situation. In other words, within two or three months, there's 100,000 people on the street, blah, blah, blah. And then within two or three months, the whole thing collapses again, which is exactly what the opposition wants, right? So for instance, like the Egyptian revolution, there's a million people in, in, in Egypt. It was massive. It was glorious. You know, it won. And then half a year later, basically, the people who were organized had taken control the Muslim Brotherhood and the military, and all those guys that had struggled for something decent, you know, a decent society, fell by the wayside because they weren't organised. So organisation requires structure, and it requires us to move away from this rigid, dogmatic, ineffectual horizontalism, which is really a massive own goal. It's a self-inflicted goal, right? No one's forcing us to do this stuff. So that's good because we can redesign it. And your generation could go, okay, that's old hat, right? We're going to learn from history. We're going to go before the last 20, 30 years and look at the old labor movements, the old civil rights movements and learn from them because they were damn effective and they were around for 20, 30, 40 years, right? Because they got themselves organized. Okay. So, I'll go through two or three reasons why this doesn't work. And it's sort of technical, but they're important to understand, right? So, the thing about organisations and large groups of people is there's lots of individuals and they have a certain amount of information and they have a certain amount of people they know and they only have a limited number of hours in the day, right? All those three things are physically set, right? They're not up to debate. It's not a moral, ideological thing. There's 24 hours in a day. We all know that, right? So the problem when you don't have any organisational structure is very difficult for them to know what other people are doing because there's no central communication. There's no central uh, decision-making, as it were. So what happens is they don't know their collective strength. And what they tend to do is then go off and do small actions or small campaigns, all of which, as we've established, don't work because the name of the game is mass collective action. In other words, lots of people coming together. So, you know, once you create that, you get what we've called the nonlinear effect. In other words, like if two or three people do something, no one's bothered. If 20 people do something, you know, a few people talk about it. If a thousand people do something, you'll be, you know, on the local news. If 20,000 people do something, you'll be in the history books. In other words, you get a massive effect by concentrating your resources in one place in time and space doing one thing. Now, the only way that collective action can happen is through coordination. And coordination requires centralization. And then, of course, we come on to the problem of how you create that. So if you create a network which doesn't have central organization, then you come to the conclusion very quickly you need it. And then you create this massive, like embarrassingly farcical situation, which goes a bit like this, is some people go, well, we need to make a decision, you know, about when the next rebellion will be, about how we throw people out, about how we deal with this policy or that policy. And of course, they won't need to involve everyone. 
and then someone says, let's do it like this, and then someone says, well, why should you decide, you know, what gives you the right, and then some people will come and create a process about how to decide, and they'll propose that, and then people will say, well, why have you decided how to decide? Maybe there needs to be more people deciding how to decide how to decide, right? And I'm not exaggerating here. Maybe some of you experienced this. So you go down this rabbit hole of, you know, painful suicide-inducing long meetings where it just goes round and round in circles because someone hasn't set up a central decision-making structure that can basically make decisions and decide what goes on. Okay, so the solution to this, to be perfectly blunt with everyone, is hierarchy. Now, hierarchy is one of those bad words, right? But in the history of social movements and in the history of radical political change, there's hierarchies already all over the place. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. Now, what I want to suggest is hierarchies can be bad and I've spent a lot of my life as a participation designer railing against hierarchy, right? Because we all know all the problems, you know, it's out there in radical culture. It's, you know, you get leaders and dominance and abuse and people making decisions which are undemocratic. However, there's a tradition in left-wing movements and in workers' cooperatives and what have you of functional progressive hierarchy. And what that means is there's a bunch of people who make the big decisions and they are clear, it's clear who they are and what decisions they can make. They can't make all the decisions. It's clear how they get into that position and it's clear how you get rid of them, i.e. through democratic elections or some form of assembly or whatever. But the point is, of course, is they can actually get on with the job and decide when the rebellion will date will be and how you took people out of the movement and all the other sort of policy areas and they can create working groups about you know what should happen but they're in charge of disciplining that system so people don't go off and do loads of different actions or go off and make different declarations and that's not perfect no one's pretending it is but it's a hundred times better than having the structurelessness of informal hierarchy in other words, once you set your network up, there's an irresistible urge, as you might say, to make some collective decisions. Otherwise, people get really frustrated. So if you don't have a clear hierarchy, i.e. a decision-making body that is functional, then informal ones will emerge. And the problem with informal hierarchy is you get the worst of both worlds. You've got a hierarchy, but you don't really have effective decision-making. And that hierarchy is usually hidden, informal. No one really knows who's in the group. It's secretive because people don't want to admit they're being a leader and what have you. And it leads to all sorts of political problems and abuses in the final analysis. So it's far better to bite the bullet and say, right, we're going to have these five or ten people in charge. We know who they are and they'll make the... The big decisions. Okay, so you know that's what you might call 101 effective organization, okay? But a lot of people don't realize that an organization is bigger than its formal constitution, which is what I've just talked about. There's also other aspects, two or three other aspects, that basically oil the wheels, as you might say, right? You know, if you're in a meeting, you know, there's rules in the meeting, but everyone knows it's not just the rules. It's also how people treat each other and the personalities and the way, the way, the more informal sociability, as you might say. Okay, so there's two or three things here that need to be understood in addition to creating this functional hierarchy. So the first thing is, unless an organisation is engaged in, in systematic training, then you'll replicate the privileged structures that people have. In other words, people that are more confident, who have got a better education, who come from a middle class background, who are more extrovert, will end up dominating the organisation because the people who potentially are better than them don't get the support. And there's no point covering this over with ideological statements like supporting the oppressed and all that business. People that are unconfident for cultural or racial reasons, the only way 
that they're going to enter into that power is by being systematically empowered through training. In other words, learning how to do facilitation, how to do minute taking, how to come up with a proposal. In other words, the nuts and bolts of what the organisation involves. And that's totally different to what I would call tokenism. So tokenism is when you say, OK, we want, you know, two black people on the central committee. Right. That's no good. That's like doesn't mean anything. What, what it all, if you want to create proper empowerment, which is deep and meaningful, then you have to engage in a cultural program for your organisation, which enables people to question their racism in workshops and enables people from unprivileged or whatever you want to call it, marginalised backgrounds to step up into their power. There's two steps it needs to be organised. The second thing is about decentralization. So you might think it's a bit funny because I've said, oh, you know, centralization is good and, um, you know, you need a functional hierarchy. Yes. And at the same time, you need functional decentralization. In other words, you need to depoliticize the whole debate. The question is what works, not what's right, because what works is what's right, if you see what I mean. So you, the 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 group that you've got in the centre of your organisation, they shouldn't be making decisions about who goes leafleting in a small town. In other words, you need to decentralise all the creative small decisions, as it were, so that people feel empowered to be creative and innovate and share ideas. So you want to create structures where people can communicate horizontally in order to find best practice. So it's not like horizontalism is rubbish, right? It's that it's only like lots of things, it's only part of the story. You need to have this central organisational structure and you need to push things out so people can feel empowered and make thing, decisions in small groups, take the initiative, do alliance of the willing sort of actions and what have you. And the third thing is about the culture. So one of the reasons Extinction Rebellion has been really successful is it wasn't just about, hey, let's go on the streets and get on with it. It designed ways of treating each other. So this is what you might call culture. And the bottom line here is respectful communication. In other words, you need to create rules. You need to have, read out a statement at the beginning of your meetings saying that we're here to respect each other. You need to have rules that if someone's abusive, they ask to leave the meeting that there's ways of communicating disagreement in a way that's not humiliating. And ultimately, if someone is continually abusive or overly ideological or being an annoying person, as you might say, then there's a clear, a clear process to ask them to leave. And that's essential. Number one, that they are asked to leave. And number two, that it's done in a clear and speedy way. In other words, it needs writing down. Now, you might think, well, that's all a whole load of faff, right? But the fact of the matter is, all the people in history that changed history had organisations. They had teams and organisations, right? And they were aiming to do it over a 10-year process. And that's what you guys need to do, right? You don't want these open networks where people just come in and drift out and get alienated because the decision-making process is a nightmare or they don't know what's going on. They don't know who the leaders are and what have you. You want to have these leaders. You want to have your orators, people who go around and do speeches. What you want is to create something that's efficient and inspiring and sustainable, right? And the ways in which I've gone through this is broadly the rules of fun. And you can watch other stuff about, you know, more of the nuts and bolts. But when you do this well, then you create what I would call beautiful empowerment, right? Where people come in feeling pushed down, alienated, marginalised, on their own, and they enter a group and they feel the love of that group, the community of that group, and they're able to grow through that community. And that community is a function of good organisation. Uh, right, OK, so the last section, this is it, on the home straights. Um, wisdom. OK, so wisdom, you know, it's old-fashioned word, isn't it? 
but let's resuscitate a few old-fashioned ideas and words. So wisdom, maybe wisdom means resilience. What does that mean? Basically, what I'm going to talk about as we finish off is what's going to keep you going, right? How you treat yourself and how you treat other people. And again, this might be, well, you know, that's not that important. It's actually totally essential to the sustainability of movement is the sustainability of the people and their ability to work with each other in a respectful way. And there's some basic rules of form I'm going to go through here. So I'm going to start in a bit of a dramatic way on this and say that learning to deal with life is really a function of being able to face death. And as people get older, they tend to be more wise, potentially, let's hope so, because they realise they're going to die and they start realising what's more important, which is to live an honourable life, to do their duty, to work for the common good, to love the people in their family, to be of service to their community and what have you. Well, if you're young, then maybe you're not so fussed. But obviously what's happened to you with your generation is you've had the actuality of death, i.e. annihilation, thrust upon you and you're horrified and furious about it for good reason. However, there's a sort of bright side of it, as it were, is through the confrontation, sorry, through the confronting of the actuality of death and moving through that actuality, you can learn how to live more effectively and in a more joyful way. And don't let me say this is easy, okay? And I'm not saying everyone can do it or it's really particularly straightforward, but it's something that thousands and millions of people have gone through and there's some general rules of thumb. So the first thing, of course, is, is that when you're young, and I'm talking about myself and I'll talk about myself a little bit more in a minute, when you're young, everything in life is a little bit black and white. You know, you get dragged along by your emotions and you get these toxic emotions of hate and love and jealousy and rage and resentment and contempt, right? And it's like one after another. And, and these sort of build up and they prevent you doing things as you'd like to do them and, and all the rest of it. And I think there's a stage which I would encourage you to investigate to the extent you can, where you have a conversation with yourself. And this is a conversation I had with myself when I was 21. So as I've said, you know, I was involved in activism from 13, 14. That's all I did for years. You know, I did my studies and I did activism. And most of that time I was furious and really emotional about what was going on. And then I used to get really resentful towards other people because they didn't turn up on time and they let me down and they weren't radical enough. And, you know, you probably know all these sort of feelings. And then when I was 21, I had this sort of dramatic realisation where I sat down and I said to myself, OK, Roger, do you want to live a life which is full of resentment and hatred and bitterness? Or do you actually want to try and enjoy your life and this gift that you've been given? And, you know, I decided that I was going to not engage in all those negative emotions. And instead, the means to overcome them was this concept of service. So that has a really concrete definition. And the concrete definition is basically the world is as it is. Whatever happens to me is the way it is. I can't change what I can't change. If someone's late to the meeting, they're late to the meeting. If someone doesn't do the washing up, they don't do the washing up. You know, if someone puts me in jail, they put me in jail. But I can attempt to change that, but it's not necessarily in re my remit. What I need to focus on is not what bad things are happening to me from other people, but what I do within my own abilities to improve the world and be of service to other people. In other words, what I want to do anyway, right? So all that negative emotion is expended for no result. It doesn't do anything, if anything, as we all know, it undermines your ability to change the world, it undermines your relationships, it makes you feel miserable, suicidal, full of self-pity, self-contempt. 
these emotions don't do anything for you. What does something positive is to get up each morning and go, okay, this is the way it is and I'm going to do A, B and C in order to try and improve it and I'm not going to be attached to the outcome. I'm going to go into service to the common good. And that, that is a sort of, there's one word for it, you know, transcendence and lots of different people say it in different ways from different cultures and backgrounds and what have you. But broadly, that's, that's what happens. Now, the catch, of course, <laughs> the catch is the most effective way to sort of come to this realisation is to experience suffering. In other words, to go into life and to experience life for what it is, instead of retreating from life every, every time there's the prospect of suffering. And this is a completely different philosophy from the ideas that you've probably been given by middle-class parents or society at large, that if something's bad, you go into some sort of safe space or you retreat from it and what have you. Now, the paradox of this is that's a privileged opportunity. The poor people of the world or people that are oppressed don't have the privilege to exit situations, to burn out, to, to retreat and all the rest of it. And one of the reasons they're more resilient, the poor people and the people that resist in the world, is that they force themselves or being forced to confront their suffering and move through it. And the attitude that you want on this is an attitude of adventure, right? That you go into your suffering and you're experiencing it and that makes you stronger. As Nietzsche said, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Now, <clears throat> I'm not trying to like glorify suffering just for the record here. What I'm saying is there's some sort of middle way here, which is suffering's coming down the road anyway, right? It's part of the human condition. But when you're presented with the possibility of engaging in risky activities, you should take that risk. And then you should go through the emotions that that creates and then learn to deal with it so you're stronger and you can be more fearless. Because as we've discussed, fearlessness is the key attribute of being able to change the world. Okay, so yes, you know, this is easier for some people than other people. And yes, I still have days when I'm totally in a rage at the world and everybody, but I've learnt to deal with that and it doesn't overwhelm me and destroy me. And I would suggest that that's one of the reasons why I've done 35 years of this sort of work and other people do six months and then, you know, become traumatised or depressed or whatever, is your attitude to life is absolutely central to your ability to do this work. And what I've said is the broad outline. You know, you can read more about it and talk to other people that know more than me. But the thing that I want to sort of emphasise here and this is another sort of contradiction of what you might call the common wisdom of being a young person today, is you absolutely have a choice, right? So in existential philosophy, which was big in the last century when terrible things happened, there was this notion that the essence of being human is to understand you always have a choice. You always have a choice to act to act in this way or act in, act in that way. So you have a choice whether to step up into resistance or not. You can't delude yourself, it's too frightening or too scary. You always have that choice. And you also always have the choice whether to descend into self-pity and misery and depression or step up into positivity. Now, that's an extreme philosophy and if you read Sartre, he's a guy who makes this really clear, and there's this notion of um, bad faith, right? So what he's saying by bad faith is human beings delude themselves that they don't have that choice. So maybe that's true or maybe it's not, but it's a provocation, right? So every time you're giving yourself a hard time or every time you decide not to go on the action, just remind yourself what Sartre said is, are you engaging in bad faith? Are you really being honest with yourself when you say you can't do this? You can't rise above your emotions or you can't engage in some direct action or whatever. Um, and what I've done, I guess, in this presentation is 
provoke you to confront the truths that you need to confront. In other words, to wake you up. And you might think that's a terrible thing and be annoyed with me or think I've been brutal or, you know, unpleasant, what have you. But the life philosophy I'm trying to communicate to you is that you need to wake up because if you don't wake up to the things that I've said, then you're in for even more suffering than the suffering that's been created through what I've communicated to you. And that's a big life lesson, which is, you know, don't kill the messenger. If someone comes in good faith, and hopefully you understand I'm coming in good faith to tell you this, then understand it's not about the messenger. This isn't about Roger Hallam's ideas, right? I'm stepping on the shoulders of giants, as I said at the start of this presentation. I'm really just communicating what other people far better at communicating than me can and have communicated in the past. So it's like, take what you need and leave the rest, but don't delude yourself that you're not taking something because you just don't want to. So the last thing to say about wisdom, of course, is with, well, not of course, but as it happens, I'm sure you know what I mean when I say that you're thrown into this life, right? You must feel that. That's how I felt when I was a teenager. What the hell's, go, hell's going on? And to be honest with you, I think most adults feel that same emotion as well. You know, you've got no idea who you are. You've got no idea what happened before you existed. You've got no real idea about why you exist and you've got no idea what's going to happen after your birth, right? The thing that you do know, or at least there's an act of faith, as it were, which is translated into understanding that this life you've given, which is undeniable because you're conscious listening to this presentation, that consciousness, that life you've been given is a gift, right? Something or someone has given it to you. You're here. It's appeared. It's here. So at least you know that. And of course, if you read the science about it or if you read religious text about it, both the science and the religion will tell you it's a miracle, right? The likelihood that you exist is like one in a thousand billion or something. Who knows? But it's a miracle that you're alive listening to what I've got to say to you in this moment. And what I want to suggest to you, of course, is that it's going to take a miracle to save your generation from annihilation. And I don't mean that in a negative sense, I mean it in a positive sense, because one of the things we need to understand is that miracles do happen, you know, when people step up and take collective action. And that's what I've tried to communicate to you in this session. So just to finish off, I've, um, I wrote this, as I said at the beginning, when I was in prison and it took me a whole day, <laughs> I think, to write it and I don't know how good it is, but I'll just finish with the feelings I had when I finished writing these 12,000 words and then I'll leave it, leave, leave you to think about it. So what I wrote was, um, I finished this as the sun is going down and the light is fading through the bars of my cell window. I found out today I'm the only activist in prison. I'm feeling alone and foolish, but I'll go to bed soon and tomorrow I will carry on. What else is there to do? I will put a smile on my face. Thanks for listening to me and good luck.